bus is the nothing personal word of the day. It's Thursday, August 11th, 2022. I don't mean genie bus. I mean a school bus, a greyhound bus. Throwing someone under that bus is a great expression. Don't throw him under the bus. Throwing under the bus is when you say something about somebody at your workplace or at your school or in your house. When you know you've done something and you blame it on someone else or you haven't done something, you know someone else has done something, no one else really needs to know that that person did something. People may suspect he did something, but you still confirm that he did that which everyone is wondering who did that. In the school of presidency, you are taught very quickly, do not throw people under the bus unless absolutely necessary. Yesterday, Christopher Illich, the owner of the Detroit Tigers, threw his GM under the bus in a way that you don't often see in baseball. The Detroit Tigers fired Al Avila, the only Latino general manager in the game, a man who had been with the organization for over 20 years, a man who I knew, he had a son who played baseball, was a catcher. He worked, I believe, for the Marlins for a time, Coca. He's had an, a really, really good career and has been the GM of the Tigers since 2015. He was brought in by Christopher Illich's father, Mike Illich, the Little Caesars guy, who, who wanted nothing but to win a World Series. The GM before him was Dave Dombrowski, and one thing you should know is that Dave Dombrowski is really good at spending other people's money, and Mike Illich gave Dave Dombrowski, plenty of money to spend in an effort to try to get a World Series. The Tigers made it to a World Series, I believe, in 06. Not much since then. And wouldn't you know, today, on August 11th, or August 10th, whenever this came out, the Tigers decided to go a different direction. It's very strange. Who's Avila? Oh, no, it's... It, are you sure it's not Avila? I th Avila? Avila? Al Avila? It is Al Avila. I'm sorry, Al. I'm so bad with names, Coca. I've known Al for 20 years, but I've never called him Mr. Avila. Avila. It is Avila, actually. Okay, can we get back to the story? Was that so necessary? I'm sorry that I mispronounced your name, but I'm about to talk about the job that you did. Firing a GM in mid-August is questionable. There is plenty of time left in the season, when you know you want to go a different direction, you make that decision sometime in August, but generally there's no reason to announce it until after the regular season. With a manager you fire during the season because you think that bringing in a new manager has a chance to change the fortune of your team. Before the draft, you can get someone in charge of scouting that could maybe change your team. Before the minor league season starts, you can get someone in there in, in development hoping to change the way your minor league system is operated. But in terms of your major league team and the entire business of baseball that is run by your president of baseball ops or your GM, firing one in August makes no business sense and it makes no baseball sense. Again, you can decide that you're moving forward with someone else next year but you would tell him, you know, with a day or two left in the season, let him finish the season or let him leave with a day or two left in the season. And then you start in earnest bringing in the new people. Because, of course, when you know you're making a change, you have started the process of identifying candidates. I don't want to shock anyone here. But when teams are making changes, either at GM or manager, they don't make the change and then say, huh, I wonder who we should hire. They've got lists in advance of who they want to interview and who they want to hire. Sometimes the decision is even made. I don't believe we ever fired a manager without knowing for sure who the next manager was going to be, and we hadn't yet started official interviews. Not one time. When we fired a general manager, the only one we ever fired was Larry. I do not believe that there was one second from when Jeffrey decided to fire Larry Beinfest he did not know who he wanted to hire, which was to promote Mike Hill and Dan Jennings. And the Marlins are not the only team. So when you do fire your GM, 
the nice thing to do, especially for a long serving employee, especially one who had won a World Series with you like Larry did in 03, the nice thing to do is you say, we have decided to make a change at president of baseball operations or a general manager. We wanna thank him very much. We wish him and his family nothing but the best. Our city and our organization is in a better place today than the day he started. Done. You may not believe it, you may not think it, you may not feel it, but that's the right way to do it. There is no reason to throw your employee under the bus in this instance. Now, if you're not firing your GM and you're being investigated by the league, let's say, let's look at Jim Crane when the Astros were investigated for garbage cans in 2017. It took him one second to say, I didn't know anything. That was all Jeff Lunau and AJ Hinch. I'm innocent. Fire everybody else. I'm good. All right, I'm in. Throw your employees under the bus, even though uh, nothing personal we told you. Of course, Jim Crane knew what was going on. Owners know what's going on. So do team presidents. It is not in any way possible to say you didn't know. But when your ass is on the line, you're going to throw people under the bus. When you're simply firing one of your employees, you can just do it because you wake up on a Tuesday and you're grumpy. You can do it because you don't like Al's shirt. You can do it because you have someone else in your ear and you're gonna give that person a try. You can do it for myriad reasons. You're the owner, you're the president. You do not need to give an excuse. We all know the Detroit Tigers had a much better season last year than was expected. They've been undergoing a long rebuild. On uh, nothing personal, you learned that when you've got Miguel Cabrera overpaid and underperforming, taking up such a huge portion of the payroll, you are not going to win. If you've got a player taking a huge portion of a payroll who is performing, then you've got a potential shot. But really, it's not good to have a player have such a high percentage of your payroll. Very hard to win as a team. But with Miguel Cabrera not playing well and showing his age, still first ballot Hall of Famer, Ovs. you know that you're going to struggle. So they end the season last year, and Chris Illich, who took over when his dad died, every time I've spoken to Chris, you can see it in his face. He wants to win a World Series for his dad who never got a chance to. He's driven by that. He was waiting for the moment that he could spend money to try to take the team over the goal line. When you undergo a rebuild, you sign free agents when you are ready to win. You sign free agents to complement your team and go from ready to win to winning. That's generally the rule of the rebuild. There are teams who violate it, but that's generally the rule. So last off season, the Tigers said, this is our off season, who do we sign? Do you remember when they signed Javi Baez and we said that it may be the worst signing of all time because he stinks? And what are they possibly giving him that amount of money for? And then they signed Eduardo Rodriguez, both coming off the high, right? Javi Baez had struggled with the Cubs, then he got traded to the Mets, and then everyone wanted him. The Mets wanted him back. There was a big fight. He went with the Tigers, so the Tigers had to overpay. Eduardo Rodriguez parlayed a good season, a good stretch into a long-term contract. And he's got like five years. They have a bunch of great rookies coming up, not all of whom have played well. Torkelson down, back, back down in the minors. But to make a long story short, when you are in a rebuild and then you sign free agents, one of two things are going to happen. You're going to get over the goal line because you signed the right free agents and you get continued growth by the core of your rebuild, the young players, or you get a step back by your core of young players. And on top of that, you signed the wrong free agents. Then you lose a hundo. And that's where the Tigers are. So I'm fine with the decision to fire Al. But what Illich said is just a little much. Let the media say it. He said our progress certainly stalled this season. All of us, the players, front office, and many of you reporters had high expectations and excitement for the season. Timeout, give me a 20. It used to be called the 24 second injury timeout in the NBA. Now they just make it a 20 second timeout because everyone started making up injuries. I need a 20. 
Reporters thinking that you are going to be good, the statistics, the prognosticators, all of the wind bags and gas bags on the air, and you using that as an evaluative tool, are you kidding me? G-M-A-B. And even if you are dumb enough as an executive to read the projections and the tweets and all of the things that people do in the media who pretend they know that they've ever run a team and you judge your evaluation of your team on that, it's moronic. And if you do do it, don't say you do it. So his PR people, I wish had told him, you can say the players, the front office, the fans, we all expected us to be good. No need to mention reporters. Okay. Unfortunately, we did not see progress this season at the major league level. Big reason why I decided it's time to make a change. There was going to be no progress at the major league level once they were done with April and May and June and July. Why now? But then something even worse happened. He was asked about the trade of Justin Verlander and J.D. Martinez, two assets the Tigers had. The trades did not work out. It happens. Do you know with the Miguel Cabrera trade, how I've always described it, that we got back Mabin and Miller and Mike Ribello, the third base coach of PhoneGate? By the way, Coco, we got to talk about PhoneGate. There's going to be like a whole investigation into whether or not he was electrically cheating using electronics to cheat. I think he was just trying to contact like stadium beef. That's what players would have a phone for, right? For texting on the field, just faster access to people you're seeing. Anyway, I've admitted to you that that trade was bad and I'm the president of the team. I said I was a part of that bad trade. You've never heard me once say, well, the players in the trade I never heard of. What do I know? I just let the baseball people do it. I've never once said that. I would never say that. When your employees see you say something like that, that means you don't have their back and that means they don't have your front. Chris Illich responding to those trades said, I didn't trade those players away. Our general manager did. Al did. Holy shnikes. That's one of the great throw under the bus moments in the history of firings. He should be ashamed of himself. You're right. Chris Illich had no idea who was being traded for and who they were getting back for Verlander and Martinez. I get it. No idea. It's not nice to say. It doesn't really matter. Coca, when we were talking about this, said to me something funny. He said, isn't it weird, though, that those trades were made and the players that they got back were bad, but yet Illich still gave... Avila an extension last year? Like, so does that mean that the trades were okay when the extension was given, but once the team wasn't good on the major league level, then he was going to mention the fact that not only is the team not playing well, but we didn't get back anybody? (laughs) He gave him the extension because he liked the progress. The rebuild's going great. I'm going to expend him. I'm going to extend him. It's pretty good. We extended him after my father had hired him in 15. He's made progress through that extension time period. That's pertinent to me. This year, we didn't see that progress. For all of you Detroit Tiger fans, I'm sorry because you have to have an owner and a president who's more willing to see the forest for the trees. There are plenty of teams who have down seasons. The Red Sox win the World Series, but then they have got down seasons. The Giants only won the World Series every other season. The biggest issue with the Tigers is not Al, it's Miguel Cabrera and the amount of money that Dave Dombrowski gave him that Mike Illich was happy to allow. Doesn't matter to me. All I know is it's the wrong time. And I'll tell you who they're going to hire. Hey, do you want to wait to see on this, Coca? Let's do an official wait to see when I say something's going to happen. When it happens, we revisit it. When it doesn't happen, we revisit it. Either way, I'm not going to let you forget or let you think that I forgot about things that I predict to happen. The Detroit Tigers are going to hire a new GM slash whatever they're calling, president of baseball operations, whatever it is. 
it's going to be a GM with experience. They are so desperate to win and to win a World Series in a central division where winning that division should be way easier than it is that they're going to bring in a GM who already has been a GM. How about Michael Hill as a candidate for that position? Hmm, wait to see. Al, good luck. You had a hell of a career. Okay, how did Aaron Judge do last night? I got to talk about the Yankees because there's so much chatter about this New York team coming out of New York, coming out of the West Coast, coming out of Houston. People comparing, wanting to say the Dodgers are the best team, wanting to say the Astros are better. People in New York saying the Mets are better, and they are. I am still raw about the way I was treated on social media when I explained that the Yankees starting rotation is not good enough and they're going to need changes. And at the time, they had pitched like 15 great games in a row. And the recency bias that people have in the media is staggering. You give someone a four for five game and that player's an all-star hitter. You have someone pitch a shutout and this guy is good. You have him pitch three good games in a row and you got yourself an all-star. You pitch seven good games in a row. This is a Cy Young candidate. It's a good thing none of you run teams. And I'm not trying to say that I was any better than you would be if you were actually running a team. I'm actually trying to say that if you were actually running a team, you would just look at things differently. You may still make better decisions than I made, but the way you would make them would be totally different than the way you look at things as a fan or as a member of the media. It's totally different. Brian Cashman knows very well that his starting rotation had, has a problem. In the last 33 games, their starting rotation has an ERA of 4.74. Is that good? Is that good enough? Is that World Series winning good enough? 33 games, that's, you know, a sixth of a season, more than a sixth of a season. It's more than a month of play. It's not nothing. Going 13 and 20 in your last 33, that's not good. Now, of course, they were 70 games over 500, so their record is still good enough to be 30 games over. Let's do better math. If they're 30 games over now and they were seven games under, they were 37 games over 33 games ago. And when you're 37 games over and you've got an extra month to play because you will not have played the 33 games where you're 13 and 20, everybody is saying, my God, they're going to break the record. They're a runaway freight train, which is how people are describing the Mets right now. They're a runaway freight train. They're going to beat the record of 116 wins. Could they get to 120? This could be the greatest Yankee team of all time. Will it be great if they don't win the World Series? Can you have a great regular season, not win the championship, and still be considered the best team? Do you have to finish? I think everyone would agree finishing is an important part of the process. So I get all of the irrational exuberance. But here we are 33 games later. Aaron Judge is still hitting. He got his 45th home run last night. He's on pace to beat Roger Maris's record. Do you know how great it would be for Aaron Judge to hold the Yankees' all-time home run record? Do you have any idea how badly Aaron Judge wants to break that record? Because if Hal Steinbrenner lets Aaron Judge leave for another team over 20 million, 50 million, or 100 million, He's trading the all-time single-season home run record holder of the most historic franchise in all of sports. In his prime. OMG. Every home run that Aaron Judge hits is like a pin in the Chris Sale voodoo doll. Except Cashman has the voodoo doll of Aaron Judge. He does not... Let me make sure I repeat this in very clear terms. The New York Yankees do not want Aaron Judge to break Roger Maris' single season home run record. God, does that make me sound terrible? But it's so true. They don't get the benefit of the marketing, of the merchandise, of the season ticket increase, They get none of that unless they retain Judge. They'd have to celebrate it right when it happened. And if it happens, God forbid, on the last game of the season, maybe they celebrate it during the playoffs. But if you know he's on your team next year, 
Then you wait and celebrate it the following season. And you do an entire on-field presentation. You get them a gift. You sell out. The secondary market for tickets to that game is going to be huge. You make it a part of buying season tickets for the next year. It gives you protection in case you don't have a good October. There's all sorts of great money reasons why you celebrate a great feat the next season, not the current season. So Aaron Judge breaks 61. Rob Banford and Bud Selig in his retirement are rooting so hard for Aaron Judge to break Bonds' record of 72. They want to get Bonds' name out of the record book so fast your head will spin. Do they put in different balls of play when Aaron Judge hits? No. Are there different balls that the Yankees play with in order to get Judge to hit more home runs? No. Do I guarantee that? Yes. That said, that doesn't mean the commissioner's office doesn't root for it. So the Yankees have this Aaron Judge situation. They got rid of Gallo. Fine. I don't think the Dodgers have lost since they got Gallo, have they? Coco, what's going on with Gallo in the... In the um, what, has he even played? Is he doing anything other than pinch hitting for the Dodgers? Do they give him a spot start since the All-Star break? My guess is he starts, what, every three games? Something like that, one game a series, and then a lefty pinch hitter off the bench maybe for the Dodgers. But I think they've done pretty well. He did homer last night. That's so awesome. <laughs> this is live, folks. Coca had no idea that Joey Gallo would even come out of my mouth. But he was ready for it. So if you're the Yankees, you're watching Aaron Judge hit all these home runs, you're losing games, you're very concerned about October because there are very many players who hit many home runs during the regular season, then they get to the postseason, they hit one, they hit two. Aaron Judge has been absolutely raking since the All-Star break. He's got like 11 home runs, like a 1,500 OPS. But guess what? The Yankees are 7-11. and 11. You need the pitching, folks. How many times do I say pitching and defense wins rings? Could there be an exception? Once in a blue moon. The moon is not blue today. The Yankees are going to have to turn their starting pitching around and then pray, pray that their offense gets super hot and they can outslug opponents four times out of seven. I'm just not sure that's going to happen. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm distracted. Oh, we have a very important series to review. And then we're going to talk about what's going on in football because Deshaun Watson is actually going to play a game this coming weekend. And the NFL is absolutely berserk about it. We're going to get to that right after the break. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. It's David Sampson. Thank you for following, rating, subscribing, telling your friends about our show. Keep spreading the word. Get onto YouTube, Nothing Personal with David Sampson. See if you can notice the jacket I'm wearing today, which is in the rotation, uh, and it was just today's turn to wear it. There's no other reason than that. But it's a jacket that you see way more often than you may know if you are on Nothing Personal with David Sampson's YouTube channel. So one of the things I watched while I was away during one of the plane rides was something called Meltdown, Three Mile Island. I never discussed this with Coca, and I actually don't know this, so I'm asking right now. Have you ever heard of Three Mile Island, Coca, other than this documentary? I mean, it was way before you were born. He had never heard of it. That's awesome. So Three Mile Island was something when I was young. I, I think it was 1970. 7, 78, 79, it was sometime in the late 70s when word came out that a nuclear power plant in Pennsylvania had had some sort of accident and there was a danger, a risk that there was radiation in the air. And at the time I lived in New York City and there was a conversation that happened at school and with parents that we may have to leave New York City because if the wind goes a certain direction, then all of the bad stuff coming from Pennsylvania could come up the turnpike and right into your building in New York City. It was like DEFCON 8 
around this country. There is now a documentary that goes through exactly what happened at Three Mile Island. There's never been a nuclear accident like it again in the United States. I wonder why. This is back in a time when Jimmy Carter was president. So it was between 76 and 80. This is back in the time when we were trying to find alternative energy because we didn't want to be reliant on the Middle East. Is this sounding any somewhat familiar? This is a time when there was nuclear proliferation and the feeling was we got this. We are going to become self-sufficient and it's gonna help our economy. We cannot let word out that there's been an accident. We gotta cover this up immediately. We gotta say everything's okay. Meanwhile, people in the community where Three Mile Island is, and Three Mile Island is Three Mile Island because it's a Three Mile Island located right near a town over a bridge. I've totally made that up, by the way. I assume it's Three Mile Island because the island is three miles. Why else would they call it Three Mile Island? It's certainly not three miles from the nearest playground, so it can't be that. It's got to be the size of the island. And it was somewhere. What year was it, Coca? 79. Okay. And... uh so the question was, what do we do as a government? And this documentary goes through every decision made by the government, what was going on on site, how the cleanup went, how information was disseminated to people in the area, when the government decided to say to New Yorkers, don't worry, you're fine. Why are we fine? Because if all of a sudden we got everyone going over the 21 bridges, that's a movie reference and it's not 21 bridges, by the way, because that includes tunnels. I think there's 21 ways off the island. Can we go check on that, Coca? The movie 21 Bridges with, I think that was with Chadwick Boseman, actually. I do not believe 21 Bridges is accurate, and that was meant to say all the different ways to leave Manhattan in an evacuation or when a criminal is trying to leave the island after committing a crime. I believe that that is a movie that was mistakenly named, and there are not 21 Bridges to get off Manhattan. I think you have to include tunnels. In any case... You can't have people evacuating New York City. They were reticent to do an evacuation order for the town right next to Three Mile Island. There'll be panic. We got to tell them everything's okay. How do you feel about that? Do you want to know the truth, even if it results in panic? It reminds me of Deep Impact. You've got the huge meteor coming. It's going to create a tsunami. It's going to wipe away both coasts. We're done. Do you want to know? Do you want people to find higher ground? Do you want to get a motorcycle like Lucas Haas? And it wasn't Lucas Haas in that movie. It was uh, another one of Leonardo DiCaprio's friends. <sighs> Who is the kid in Deep Impact? Coca, I'm sorry. I'm asking you too many questions. He's going crazy. He's in my hair. Stop asking me to look at stuff. All right. I can't Google it while I'm talking. I can't talk and Google at the same time. It's not Tobey Maguire. I can picture his face. He wasn't the kid from Witness. That was Lucas Haas. But he was sort of the, he's in that, Elijah Wood. Yes. You're the best, Coca. You are the best. Am I right that Elijah Wood and Tobey Maguire and Lucas Haas, aren't they all sort of in that Leonardo DiCaprio tree of, of life? Anyway, what would you do? Would you want to know or not know? And this documentary goes through the people who wanted to know and what they did to try to find out the truth and what the government did to try to cover up the truth, what the private company who was hired to clean up did to cover up the truth, what the private company did who was actually the energy company who had the nuclear reactor, what they did to say, hey, we're okay. I mean, like Jonathan Larson rent type of you okay, we're okay, everything's okay. Meanwhile, we're all dying of AIDS, nothing's okay. People were glowing in Pennsylvania. But we did not evacuate New York City. The wind apparently didn't shift the way it was supposed to shift in order to put us in jeopardy. And there was no danger because it was contained. We've contained it, they said. Jimmy Carter came and shook a bunch of hands, addressed the country and said, we've got this under control. You may want to check out this documentary. You think that Obama, Clinton, Trump, Nixon, Biden, doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on. Presidents are presidential because they don't want to tell you stuff that's going on. Because they have been elected in their mind to decide what you should know and what you shouldn't know. And what's better for you not to know. There's a whole lot of things better for us not to know. Trust me. 
You do not want to know how the political sausage is made. You don't want to know how government contracts are given. You don't want to know how your roads get paved or garbage gets picked up. Trust me. Three Mile Island. Check it out. It's not with Elijah Wood. All right, we had a record again yesterday, Coca. This is unreal. It's our third correction from one episode. First, it was the Pete Rose episode about when he was on the field. Then on that episode, thank you very much for all the people who are getting to back shows. Those count. Like CBS knows when people are listening to back shows, and we appreciate that. Someone listened to the Rose episode and had another correction from the same damn episode. I said that Bud Black was the manager of the Padres. It's Bob Melvin. Sorry. Third correction. You know I'll do it. All right, Deshaun Watson. He's getting all ready. Today is Thursday. He's got a big-time preseason game. He looked at Aaron Rodgers yesterday and said, ah, you don't play preseason, but guess what I do? I'm ready to go. I'm ready to keep changing that narrative from happy endings to touchdown passes. I got to get out there. I got to show the people of Cleveland that they should get behind me because I'm going to be so much better than May Bakerfield, than um, Baker Mayfield for six, nine. I got to show the fans of Cleveland I'm going to be so much better than Baker Mayfield. They're going to forget about him. They're going to embrace me. So the Browns have agreed to start to Sean Watson in the preseason game this weekend. And I was picturing Roger Goodell and the NFL, and they've got a decision to make. The decision is very simple. And it's been articulated in a, in a general way on the InterGoogle, but I want to go into slightly more detail for you. The question is asked, does the existence of this preseason game and of Deshaun Watson playing, did the Browns play Deshaun Watson in order to get Harvey to make his decision faster on the suspension? Because maybe Friday at 7 o'clock when Deshaun Watson takes the field, if he's suspended or there's a final decision on the length of suspension, then he won't play. I've got a surprise for you. If he's suspended for 10 games instead of six, or 17 games instead of six, or six games instead of six, he's still playing the preseason game. He's not going to be suspended retroactively for preseason. And the Browns already are preparing for their season knowing that he's not playing in week one. But they also know he hasn't taken a snap in a year or more. And they've got to get him reps in a game atmosphere. And I don't mean a two-team practice. Roger Goodell knows this. Peter Harvey knows this. And Deshaun Watson knows this. What Harvey is deciding is on a suspension of greater than six games or equal to six games. He's not deciding on a suspension of fewer than six games. That's not an issue. Again, we are discussing whether he will be suspended for more than what Judge Robinson gave him, not less. No matter what, he is suspended for games one through six, period. His earliest game is going to be game seven of the season. They've got to get him in to preseason games because once the season starts, he will not have game action. It's not like you can go on a minor league rehab assignment like in baseball. What's he going to do? Go to the XFL, USFL, the UAL, the NAL, NCAA, and play, play a game? No. You get reps in practice. That's it. Padded practices, which are limited. That's it. You want game action when you're facing a suspension? You get it during the preseason. I completely understand and agree with why they're playing Deshaun Watson right now because they can. And for all of the women who are impacted, for all of the men who are angry, for all of the people who are saying the NFL should not allow him to put on a uniform, period. I couldn't agree with you more. But Roger Goodell has made it clear that he wants to be hands off Wink, wink. He's the most hands-on commissioner out of all four, by far. 
He's got his little hands in every single cookie jar that is the NFL. And to walk away from this, to not have an agreement with Jimmy Haslam when he signed with the Browns that Deshaun Watson will not put on a uniform or step on a field until we have final disposition on exactly what's happening with Deshaun Watson. We're not going to do it. But Roger didn't say that. Do you know why he was inactive with the Texans? Do you think that was a Roger Goodell move last year? Don't forget, this is the player who demanded a trade, who would not play for his team. And yet the Texans still paid him. He was never suspended. Are you going to watch Deshaun Watson this weekend? That's the question I need to know. Are you going to watch him? Because for all the people who are so mortified over his conduct, who are so morally centered and say, this is someone I cannot wrap my head around. This is someone who's embarrassing, disgraceful, even criminal, despite what a grand jury would say. Are you going to watch him? Are you going to listen? Of course you are. Nothing personal pick of the day. Rained out. God, that stinks. When you're the Toronto Blue Jays and you get rained out when you got to win a game over the Orioles, not good. 81 and 66. That's our record. Who's watching the Field of Dreams game tonight? Who knew there was a Field of Dreams game tonight? I'll bet you a dollar Coca did not know tonight was the Field of Dreams game. If you are a baseball fan, the Field of Dreams in Dyersville, Iowa. I've been there twice. I have swung a bat from the plate of the Field of Dreams. I've thrown a pitch from the mound of the Field of Dreams, which is by no mean, by no means a regulation mound. I've walked the outfield. I have bought souvenirs. I have driven a Jeep, an open roof Jeep, into the Field of Dreams, the way they do it in the movie, trying to recreate that feeling when Larry Beinfest and I took a road trip to Dyersville and Omaha, that road trip. Major League Baseball does something interesting here. They are all looking for inventory. NFL is, NFL just announced it. I don't know, are you paying attention to how this works? Did you read the NFL is going to have a good Friday game? So you've got Thanksgiving Thursday and a bunch of teams have to play. It used to be Lions and Cowboys, one on CBS, one on NBC or ABC. I think it was NBC, whatever it was. You had two games, it was always Lions and Cowboys and you had John Madden with the turkey leg, and it was a Thanksgiving tradition, but you always in the back of your head said, God, that sucks for the crew and for the players. They cannot be with their family if they're the road team on Thanksgiving. The crew, by definition, is on the road, the announcing crew, but they're doing it for us, the fans, so we can sit there and get hammered and eat until we are stuffed, no pun intended, and watch football. Then the NFL said, you know what? Why have two games when you could have three? Hell yeah. That's another network getting to pay for a Thanksgiving game where you've got a bunch of audience members and that's what they're doing. They're with families. They can't get off the couch because that's America. John Cougar Mellencamp. And they're going to watch football. Then the NFL said, hmm, I got another idea. Let's get a couple hundred mil and play a game on Friday. Now they called it Black Friday. I had not heard what Black Friday was, and I learned yesterday that Black Friday is about shopping. Like, you get discounts. So, whatever. Anyway, there's going to be an NFL game the day after Thanksgiving, which means there's going to be a road team that is traveling to that game on Thanksgiving, which means there's going to be an entire another crew of announcers and production people who are going to miss Thanksgiving because they can't do Thanksgiving Thursday and then go to the game and have it ready for production for you Friday. But it's an empty day on the calendar. This is the beginning of the NFL saying, we're not just going to own Sundays. We're going to add Saturdays at the end of the season, and you're going to love it. And we're going to have Mondays for sure. How about double headers? And Thursday, Thanksgiving. How about a Thursday night game? We'll put that on Amazon. It ain't free, but you're going to find it. Let's add a Friday. There will be a time in my lifetime where the NFL has games seven days a week during the season. How can you pass it up? It's too good to be true. It's like printed money. If you had a way to print money and you did not do it, why not? So the NFL announces this. 
and MLB, of course, is going crazy because we try to do the same thing. We're trying to add games, but we play every freaking day. So instead of adding games, we add locations. Do you think the NFL always announces, yeah, we're going to Germany, we're going to London, that's part of expanding internationally. But they don't say, yeah, we're going to play a game in Canton, a regular season game, that is. We're going to play a game in the Field of Dreams. MLB does that. I went to Fort Bragg. The Marlins played at Fort Bragg. We were honoring the troops. The stadium was built on Fort Bragg. It was very, very cool. We got to talk to troops and play in front of the troops' families where the season, where the ticket holders who were able to go to that game. And it was a great thing. And Rob Manford and Tony Petiti and Bud Selig back when he was around, they were looking for more of these ideas because that's what baseball has to offer. They go out to their TV partners and say, hey, will you add money if we give you an exclusive game and we do it in a cool place? Like tonight's game is nationally televised between the Cubs and the Reds, two teams who SU triple CK. Two historic teams, fine. But who wants to watch us? Cubs-Reds game tonight. But it's not going to be at Wrigley. It's not at the Great American Ballpark. It's actually at the Field of Dreams. They did it last year, and there was that walk-off by Tim Anderson of the White Sox. Do you even remember? It's extra money to owners because the network pays, but the network doesn't pay nearly for a Field of Dreams game what it pays for an extra football game. And when you only do it once like Good Friday or Black Friday and Field of Dreams, that's apples to apples. We are adding a game to the national schedule. What are you going to pay for it? And the NFL got way more for that Black Friday game than Major League Baseball did for the Field of Dreams game. That's just how it goes. So then baseball says, what we can't do individually, we're going to do with volume. So let's come up with a bunch of other games, a bunch of other things that we can offer to TV rights holders to whether it's ESPN or Turner or MLB Network, whoever it is. And let's see if we can find more games. So they announced that there's going to be Cardinals are going to London. We've got that. It's just funny to me. The players don't like doing this stuff. They're going to be all happy and they're going to walk through the corn and they're going to give interviews and they're going to say this is an honor to be here. Do you realize that Field of Dreams is from 19 what, Coca, 1989 maybe? The number of players playing who were born in 1989. How many players on the Cubs or Reds were born before 1989? They'd have to be 33 or 34 years old right now. Baseball players don't sit around watching Field of Dreams. It doesn't mean anything to them. It still means something to the people my age and owners' ages. And the TV networks are willing to pay for it because it looks cool. But to players, they view it as having to go to a place that's not their home, not their usual road hotel in a city, go to a different hotel in the middle of Eckveld, have to do extra interviews, and it's a total pain in their ass. And they tell their union how much they don't want to do these things. The players get paid extra to do these things. It's negotiated in the CBA that any game not played at a home park is Subject to extra per diem, which means extra meal money and extra inconvenience money, and extra pay. These players don't go to London for free. Now, of course, they do go for free because they fly over first class in a sleeper seat in a private plane. And on top of that, they get more money. They just have to look right when they cross the street. But other than that, that's all they have to do on their own. Everything else is totally paid for. Same with when you go to Puerto Rico or when you go to Dyersville. Believe me, not one player is looking forward to it. So then who do you even pick in a game like that? Now nah, we're picked the Cubs. Cubs over the Reds in the Field of Dreams game were 81 and 66. When the NFL, when Major League Baseball, when every one of these leagues is putting more content, pushing more content towards you, I hope you smile and say, it's just business. This is nothing personal.